Hello and welcome everyone from the uh, West Coast, the East Coast, the Central United States, um, other parts of the world. Thank you for, for um, joining us. I'm Gustavo Tolosa and I'm the host of this webinar and um, very excited to have another chance to visit with the one and only Dr. McDougall, who is so kind to agree to do a webinar every now and then with me. And um, even though we've done, I don't know, hundreds, right, Dr. McDougall? But At it's least. least you know, we've done, <laughs> hundreds, we yes. did them together for years, Gustavo. I mean, we probably have the best collection, you and I, together of, uh, of, of online video audio uh, yeah, those that I have. I mean, we really put a lot on. We put a lot on tape. Let's put it that way. We did. We. I think we touched just about every topic. And I don't know if you remember this uh, little piece of uh, trivia, but um, our first webinar was in French. Do you remember that? It was in French. Okay. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, because I was. I wanted to test the system, and yeah. there was this group of. French people in, in Paris that wanted a, a, a webinar on the Starch Solution. So our yeah. first webinar was in another language. And so anyway, but then we started. Well, we've been trying for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have. Well, again, thank you and um, for today. And um, we have a topic that people are very excited about uh, to to hear your opinion. We did webinars on cancer before, um, but I have, uh, people will be able to put questions here, but I would like to start by asking you uh, three questions in one <laughs> and and then, then expand and watch whatever you want to say about the topic. I, my, my questions are, if you could, give us uh, an overview of what cancer is or how it develops. I know there are many types of cancer, so maybe not, uh, you know, it's easy to go into all the details. And then um, what is the McDougall diet and how can that help to prevent cancer or to reverse it in some cases if, if that's possible? So, uh, how does that sound? Can we do that first? Well, as, as you say, there are many, many different kinds of cancer and, and many different causes. I think probably is making it as uniform as possible. Uh, cancer results from chronic irritation of the body. What happens is you chronically damage the body, say with cigarette smoke or alcohol or environmental chemicals. So you chronically damage the body. You know, most of the time cells divide. But sometimes cells just get injured, genetic material gets injured, and they, st they, stop, uh, they stop their um, their basic rules as far as how cells are supposed to act. You know, cells aren't supposed to divide under their own free will. I mean, they can divide when you're growing, say children, and they can divide if you injure yourself. Say you cut yourself badly, you can you can uh, expect that the wound's going to heal because the cells that are proximal to the injury are going to divide. But otherwise, cells aren't allowed to divide. If they were allowed to divide on their own free will, will we be a misshapen mess, mass, mass or mess, the same thing. Uh, and that's, I think, the good general thought about what happens to cancer is it's chronic injury to the cells of the body and some of the cells, most die, but some don't die. They just become unneighborly. And as a result, they start spreading to other parts of the body. And it's the spread to the other parts of the body, the metastases from solid tumors that kill. Solid tumors being breast, colon, prostate, lung cancer. It, it's not the, the tumor itself that kills. People don't die of breast cancer or colon cancer. They die of the, uh, the cells that escape into the venous blood system and spread to the liver, brain, bones, lungs, etc. Now, as far as the natural history of cancer goes, I think it's important people understand this. And this has to do with solid tumors, not with tumors like blood tumors like leukemia, lymphomas. It's solid tumors like breast, colon, prostate, lung cancer. Is uh, 
one cell, say one cell in the breast, gets chronically injured, say chronically injured from industrial waste chemicals. And uh, that particular cell, it didn't get injured bad enough to die, but it got injured bad enough to start, start doubling its own free will. And the average doubling time for a cancer cell is about every 100 days. So if you take one breast or one prostate, you got two breasts now, you take one breast or one prostate, they contain a billion cells, okay? Actually, they contain more than a billion, they contain 100 billion cells, one breast, one prostate. So you have one cell that's lurking in a breast or prostate that contains 100 billion cells. You can't find that. The cancer cell starts dividing, say, every 100 days. So three and a half months later, you've got two cancer cells. Three and a half months later, you've got four cancer cells. You know, in a year, you've got 12 cancer cells lurking in a breast or prostate that contains 100 billion cells. You're not going to find it. The divisions continue, and finally, you reach a tumor mass of a million cells. The tumor is six years old, and the size of the tumor is a period on a paper or a lead tip of a pencil. It's been growing for six years. It's going through enough divisions to create a million cells. It's undetectable by any means. That's why early detection fails. That's why treatment fails, with few exceptions, is because the, the tumor is already advanced. It's not early detected. It's already advanced, and if it's truly cancer, by the time it's a six-year-old disease, containing a million cells the size of a period on a paper. If it's really cancer, it's spread to other parts of the body. Finally, the tumor becomes detectable on average when it's been growing for 10 years. It's the size of an eraser of a pencil. It's a centimeter in size. It contains a billion cells. At this point, you can finally find it by breast self-examination, by elevation of PSA testing, Actually, mammograms find tumors even later. The reason is because early tumors are found by the woman herself, whereas the ones that grow slowly are detectable by mammography. So you, the average tumor detected by mammography is 14 to 17 years in development. All right, so what I've told you is that cancers, particularly uh, solid mass cancers, well, we could even go into blood cancers. But cancers are caused by chronic irritation. And some cells, they deteriorate genetically to a point where they stop being neighborly and they start dividing at their own free will. And they also have the ability to spread outside of the tumor through the venous system to other parts of the body. That's called metastases. What you need to understand is the cattle are already out of the barn. This is late detection. The disease on average is 10 years old by the time you're aware of it. So that's the development of cancer. Now, the question is, is how does this tie into diet, which is my interest? You know, you've got the cigarette part, right? I mean, most people understand the cigarette part. You suck on a tube of tobacco and you get cancer. Uh, how about the dietary issues? Well, dietary cancers are the cancers of the breast, colon, and prostate and body of the uterus. And to some extent, you know, basically all the cancers have a diet connection because you do better if you eat well. You do poorly if you eat poorly in terms of uh, most cancers I can think of, even skin cancers like melanoma. So uh, what happens is when you eat the Western diet, there it's the wrong food. I and mean, that's, that's the most honest way I can explain it to you is the Western diet is the wrong food. It, it, con it contains a lot of products you wouldn't even feed to your animals. So... Because it's the wrong food, it causes chronic irritation, and the body has the inability to repair properly. And as a result, you know, I would say breast cancer uh, is due to overstimulation of the breast from, say, environmental contaminants. Probably. Where do the environmental contaminants come? Well, they come from the air, but most of them come from the food. And there are components of the diet that we've discovered that have made tumors grow faster, like fat. Fat causes uh, exaggerated growth of tumors, even, even vegetable fats, like, for example, flaxseed oil. You know, you're all taking flaxseed oil for your heart or whatever. It's on omega-3 fat, right? Well, flaxseed oil in animal experiments has been shown when you have a control group and a group you feed the flaxseed oil to. 
that the volume is a thousand times greater in tumor size for those who got the flaxseed. A tremendous promotion of, of cancer growth. I could go into a whole, all kinds of uh, components of the Western diet. We could talk about the lack of fiber, you know, because you lack fiber, the, the cancer-causing chemicals that are in your stool have more direct contact. When you eat dietary fiber, which is only from plants, you kind of dilute the stool out and you neutralize some of these cancer-causing substances from the plant food, from the food, or on bad diet generally. So there are all kinds of components uh, of plants, but it's, it's not important that you know all the details. What you need to know is that the rich foods make you sick and cause cancer, like meat, the chicken, you know, dairy products, oils. You know, these, these are not sugar. I mean, I know sugar has been promoted as the scapegoat for cancer. It's not sugar. Sugar is not good for you, but it's not sugar that promotes cancer. Anyway, the, it's, it's the rich Western diet that uh, sets you up for cancer and promotes the growth of cancer. So what's the obvious solution? You stop throwing gasoline on the fire. And uh, I wrote the first uh, scientific study that has ever been published in the literature, the medical literature, on the dietary treatment of breast cancer. Uh, it was published in 1984 in the journal Breast. And what I said is, look, I think I know what causes breast cancer, the rich Western diet. I believe that if we take women who already have breast cancer, and we put them on a healthy diet, that they will do better. And what I found out is they did better. They reduce the prognostic factors that predict that a woman will die early. Overweight women die earlier. Women with high cholesterol die earlier. Uh, certain hormones like estrogens and prolactins, when they're elevated, they die earlier. You know, they die sooner than a woman who has the opposite characteristics. And so what I showed in this particular study is women already have breast cancer. They can change the prognostic factors. Now, my follow-up on a few of the women says they did really, really good. Well, since that publication in 1984, there have been multiple studies that have been published on the dietary implications of cancer, not just in prevention, but in terms of treatment. And all of them say the same thing. If you cut the meat out, you cut the oil out, you cut the animal foods out, and instead you eat a diet of potatoes and rice and corn and so on, that you live longer. The data has accumulated to the point where February 13th, 2015, the American Cancer Society came out and told the practicing doctors, the patients, that diet needs to be a fundamental part of their therapy. You will live longer if you eat a good diet. And they gave a lot of the scientific studies that supported this. If you'd like to do a quick review, you go to my website, which is drmcdougall.com, look under newsletters, and you look at the February 2015 newsletter. You know, I did a whole, whole review on it for you there, so you can understand all the implications. So not only do I believe, not only does the science support, but the American Cancer Society comes out and tells you, you need to change your diet. Unfortunately, that's rarely translated from the doctor, practicing doctor, to the patient. And so, you know, they get one option, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And it would be okay if those things worked, but they don't. And I do mean that as a generalization. There are some exceptions. They don't. They cause more harm than good. Extremely expensive. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, if you, had a, uh, if you had a wonderful option, say, for example, we had this pill that cured breast cancer, you wouldn't have to tell a woman to change her diet, but we don't. So women ought to be advantaged uh, in every way, and that means a good diet to prevent breast cancer and to treat. Men, that means a good diet to prevent prostate cancer and to treat. And men and women, colon cancer. It's, it's gender indiscriminate, but still the diet that you ought to be eating is the same. So that, that's pretty much what I would have to tell you about, uh, about cancer. We could talk about uh, leukemias and lymphomas, which are related to uh, viruses, uh, which are spread through meat and dairy. So, okay. Any right. other critical questions? Very good. I uh, 
I do have a question here. I Someone types, I have had lung cancer. Now, two and a half years later, the CT says it's okay. What do I do pr to prevent recurrence? Well, I think you just um, mentioned it. Well, a couple of things. Uh, one, there have been several studies that I'm aware of that show that people who quit smoking before the diagnosis of lung cancer live, I don't know, two to four times longer than those who continue to smoke after they learn they have lung cancer. So you want to stop throwing on the fire. And then, and then you want to eat a good diet because a good diet is going to support you in all ways. Uh, for example, a, a sunshine-induced cancers. Okay, irritation of the skin. Remember, we talked about irritation. Irritation of the skin from overexposure to sunshine causes damage. Uh, the initial damage is called actinic keratosis, and then that that's precancerous, and that, then that goes on to squamous and basal cell carcinomas. Study published uh, in the 1980s in the New England Journal of Medicine took uh, patients who had these precancerous and sometimes cancerous lesions on their skin. And what they did is they changed them toward the kind of diet that I recommend. And they found that the recurrence of these skin lesions, precancerous and cancerous, was reduced by two to six times in those who ate a healthy diet. So, you know, even though the irritation may be from sunshine in the case of skin or tobacco smoke in the case of lung cancer, you need to be, have a system that will defend and repair the best it can from these damaging substances. So, yeah, you ought to change your diet. Yeah, you ought to not smoke. And, yeah. Right, right. Okay. Well, what, what is uh, shocking to many people is what you said earlier, which is that early detection, really, uh, the, uh, people are confused because they, they I believe, at, at one point, I believed it, that early detection meant, like, a month after cancer started in my body, I would find out. And that's what early detection meant. But you're saying that it takes six maybe to even 10 years until by the time this early detection happens, right. it, it, it could have spread. And I think that's well, a- It, it has spread, it has spread. Not could spread, it has spread. That's, why, has spread. that's why early detection fails. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, rather crude early detection techniques like breast self-examination, which women have been told to do. The uh, Canadian Task Force on Preventative Medicine in the year 2001 came out and told women not to do that. Don't, don't do breast self-examination because you end up finding out more problems than helpful events. The uh, U.S. Preventative Set Task Force in 2010 told U.S. citizens to stop doing breast self-examination. When it comes to prostate, uh, generally men are given an option. Uh, one is watchful waiting, the other is radiation, the other is surgery. The reason is, is because it makes no difference. And every doctor in Europe, South America, North America knows this. And we treat men better than we treat women. So we give men a little bit more of the truth. And they're treated a little bit more humanely than we treat women. Just a gender thing. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, so uh, early detection for skin cancer and for uh, oral cancers, uh, they are so inefficient and result in so many unnecessary findings that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force said, don't do those screening techniques. The only uh, screening techniques that are pretty much universally recommended are mammography and screening for colon cancer. A mammography screening has been controversial, and the benefits are small. And the harm is so, so, so great that the Cochrane Collaboration, which is the most respected review body of scientists, 40,000 scientists. The Cochrane Collaboration in 2013 came out and told women worldwide, don't get mammography. Okay, colon cancer, screening for colon cancer. It's kind of a long story, but let me tell you the, 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 the bottom line. In 2019, the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Medicine told Canadian citizens to stop getting colonoscopies. Okay, 
And in the United States, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, they tell you, you know, colonoscopies are the, are the gold standard. But then they go on and tell you you get the same results, whether you check your stool for blood, which costs, you know, a couple of bucks, or whether you get a sigmoid exam, which costs a couple hundred dollars, or whether you get a colonoscopy, which costs over $3,000. And the harms done from colonoscopy are huge, but the benefits are the same regardless. And the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says so. I don't know what they say in South America, Gustavo, but I can tell you in Europe, colonoscopies have never been recommended. You know, so you guys have unfortunately been sold by an idea that if you find it early, you could cure it or at least delay death. I just explained to you, it's not early when you discover it. The tumors have already spread if they're really cancer. But a lot of what is found in tumors is not really cancer. It doesn't spread. Or what happens commonly is that the, the person dies of something else first. Say the cancer is going to kill you when you're 120 years old. <laughs> you're going to die of something else first. Uh, and I exaggerate there, but it is true. You know, I can, I can show you reports of women who died of their original breast cancer 35 years after it was diagnosed. So uh, anyway, when you put all the cards on the table, what we find out is this is a huge multi-billion dollar a year business to screen yeah. you for various, to various cancers. It's not just the tests in the hospitals. It's the doctors, the drug companies. I mean, just the... the uh, Downturn economics, okay, what do they call it? Anyway, it's just huge yet as it flows downstream. Right, right. It's the doctors, the drug companies, the testing. You know, it's a huge business. So uh, the problem is, is that it's a lie. And you can prove this to yourself. I mean, you can go through the research. You can read the Cochrane collaboration papers. Uh, you can read. You can look up the Canadian recommendations on colonoscopy. You, you know, this isn't hard to figure out in this day and age. And once you figure out you've been lied to, then you might start looking for some other alternatives that are cost-free, side effect free, that would help you in every way of your life, and that's to fix the food. Right, all right. All right, all right. So, Dr. McDougall, do you, what do you say to people that, <laughs> because there are those who say, well, I did have a test, I discovered, they discovered the cancer, early, let's say, and I was saved. Um, so there are cases in which that happens, correct, or not? Well, yeah, okay, maybe, sure. I mean, yeah. cancer is slow growing. Uh -huh. and something else kills you first. You know, if you die of old age or a heart attack before, you know. Uh, we just don't see it. You see, Gustavo, the way you have to prove that something works is you do it by randomized control trials. What's yeah. doing the case of screening, okay? For screening to prove whether it works or not is you take one group of people and you screen them and you don't the other population. And the group that are screened, when you get done with the experiment, you should find more people alive, okay? In all studies that looked at it by this proper scientific method, a randomized control trial, all studies, or excuse me, the general understanding is, based upon all the randomized controlled trials, is that there isn't a single early detection technique, a single screening method that prolongs life. Now, what it does is this. is uh, Say, for example, colon cancer. Say you save some people from dying of colon cancer, and you'd probably do. But then in, in the same vein, you kill people through the treatments and the anesthesia and the surgery. So, you know, when it all comes out in the wash, you get the same number of people alive whether you screen or don't screen. And that's what counts is overall mortality. All you want to know is how long am I going to live? You know, I don't, I don't really want to hear I'm not going to die of colon cancer. I'm going to die from perforation of, uh, on the operating table looking for my colon cancer. And by the way, think about it. When you're asked to screen, say colonoscopy, you're asked to have a colonoscopy. Okay, the, the perforation rate is about uh, one in a thousand. The death rate from perforation is about one in two thousand. Serious complication rate when there's polyps involved is seven percent. What you're doing when you're asked to have a colonoscopy is you're asking your 
risk your life today for the three theoretical possibility that in 20, 34 years, you won't die of colon cancer. And again, in the wash, when you look at randomized controlled trials, there's no survival benefit from any screening technique. Not breast cancer, not lung cancer, not colon cancer, not prostate cancer. That's all. Right. Yeah, I, I understand it. I, I, I think a lot of people have a hard time um, accepting that fact because you're saying, you know, it's overall uh, mortality. And of course, when you talk about each person's life, it's a, it becomes uh, more personal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know that, that's the thing. Let's just take a uh, look at the breast cancer screening techniques. What the data comes down to, and it might be getting a little complicated for some of you, but here are the, here's the data, is that for every 2,000 women that you screen, you may save one life, okay? In the process, you diagnose somewhere between five and 50 women as having breast cancer that would have never known they had breast cancer. It's just because you were busily looking. Now you change their lives. They're no longer Mary or Jane. They're breast cancer. Hey, 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 you know, can't get a job, can't get insurance. You live with this diagnosis for the rest of your life. And the diagnosis is wrong. It's called overdiagnosis. It's wrong for somewhere between, well, let's just say 10 and 50 women for 2,000 mammograms. And, and when you look at the women who had to go on for further biopsies and surgery, you've harmed somewhere between, out of the 2,000, between 200 and 600. So, you know, if you were presented with that data that you had a one in 2,000 chance of being saved by having, uh, having mammographies done, as opposed to say a, a one in 10 chance that you were gonna be, be, a, be diagnosed as a breast cancer victim, you'd have to live with the treatments and the stigma, and that would be wrong. That'd be wrong, you, you would have never died out of the 10 women of the 2000. I mean, what, what would you do? I, I, you know, women are asked to be given a choice and to be told this kind of, given this kind of discussion in the US, uh, our, our uh, governing bodies of medical education and treatment tell us that uh, it's our responsibility as doctors to explain the benefits and the risks and harms, but we don't. I mean, let's face it, doctors have this dog way of talking to their patients. And it's not always, it's not always right. 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 They're not always right. No, no that's for sure. Um, Kathy here says, I have an uncle just diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. You are saying that diet and lifestyle rather than treatment may prolong his life? Okay, write this down. You go to my website, drmcdougall.com. And you look up my November 2011 newsletter. And that letter and newsletter is titled, Why Did Steve Jobs Die? Steve Jobs died of pancreatic cancer. I go through the entire discussion. Uh, all the treatments. This is the, one of the richest men in the world. He died in 56. All the money, all the access to modern science, you know, access to liver transplants, which he had, every chemotherapy, which he wanted. So if far greater resources than you and I have, he, he was not saved not one day. In fact, I can argue that his life was shortened by all this aggressive treatment. Now, Steve Jobs, I believe, lived, uh, died at 56. I believe he got his pancreatic cancer in his 20s. And so he lived an awful long time with this disease. And Steve Jobs was vegan during most part of his life. Now, I, I you know, my... My understanding is vegan eating was spent in restaurants quite a bit, and this doesn't necessarily have to be healthy food. So uh, anyway, this whole discussion in my November 2011 newsletter will, will explain to you. Or you can just go to YouTube, and you can look up McDougal and Steve Jobs, and you'll see a lecture that I gave on this subject. And so YouTube has it, just McDougal, Steve Jobs. It, it comes up right away. Right, right. Yeah, I've seen that lecture. Very good, very good. Um, so basically, Dr. Martul, just to just to say one more time, you really, because um, some people are asking for, for clarification, you really do not uh, recommend 
uh, routine mammograms and routine right. colonoscopies. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. It's just, it's contrary to science. It may be good for business, but it's contrary to science. That, and right. an oath that I swore to take care of my patients. Right. You know, so no, I, I don't recommend mammograms and I don't recommend colonoscopies. Now, do I recommend checking the stool for colon cancer? I do. In, in this case, what we're talking about is reducing the risk of dying of colon cancer. And the way I have uh, men and women do this is, is by the recommended techniques. Uh, like, for example, the Canadian government, you know, their, their task force on, on preventative medicine, they say that you should discover a colon cancer doing a sigmoid, which is a short two-foot tube, uh, and or checking the stool in various ways. And I've recommended that for almost 30 years, that you should do one or the other or both. You know, it depends on how paranoid you want to be. And you should start these examinations at around age 50. So you have one sigmoid exam at age 50 to 60, 55 to 60, and you should never have another one again if that's clean. Uh, if you decide to check your stool, you should check your stool for a few years, starting around age 60. But no, I never recommend a colonoscopy for screening. Now, you know, if you find something, you may have to have this instrument and help the patient. That's, that's different. But uh, as far as looking for trouble, it's called disease mongering. Does it, you cast this huge net over the population, catch them. So you say, hey, everybody's got to have a PSA. What do you think you capture for the prostate cancer business? Billions. Disease market, that's what's bad. Yes, it's just that it's so difficult, like someone is saying here, it's so difficult when physicians argue with you that you have to be screened, especially when you're over 50. And there you have, you're in front yeah. of your doctor that you trust, and they're really pressuring you to do that. And yeah. um, what would you say? Tell us. Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends. You know, I have written extensively on this. And so people yeah. could copy yeah. my particular writings and take them to the Right. All right. my discussions, right. I, I did two thorough newsletters on colonoscopy. I've done multiple, multiple writings in books that I've written and, and newsletters, which are free uh, about breast cancer screening and treatment. So right. you can take my data or you can go to the head of the Cochrane Collaboration and you could buy a book. Peter uh -huh. Gertzky is the man's name. Peter Gertzky was the head of the Cochrane Collaboration for more than 20 years. And Peter Gertzky wrote a book called Mammography, Truth, Lies and Controversies. It's called Mammography, Truth, Lies, and Controversies. It's a difficult read. Now, I read it because I knew the studies he talked about, and I, I was not bogged down by it. But if any doctor said to me, as a woman who didn't really understand what was going on, you must have a mammogram, and I'd say, doctor, read this book. This is the head of the Cochrane Collaboration. Read this book, and then you tell me I have to have a mammogram. I, I guarantee you, all the doctors I've given his book to came back and said, whoa, I would never recommend mammograms. It's, it's, it's fraud. It's based upon money. That, you know, it's the usual story. Yeah, it's the usual story. But, but, in this case, power and money and, and, and gender bias. We don't do these things to men, ladies. We don't do the aggressive sex screening and treatment that we do for you. Even though breast cancer and prostate cancer are essentially the same disease. As far as cause, treatment, natural history, failures of treatment, et cetera, mutilation, harm, costs. You know, they're, they're almost identical diseases, one affecting women, the other affecting men. But we treat men much better. Believe me, we give you guys an option. And we have laws that protect you. We have, uh, actually, we have laws, uh, Gustavo, we have informed consent laws. Uh, and I was involved in the third informed consent law in the nation. This was uh, done in the early 1980s. Uh, I was a practicing doctor in Hawaii. And a group of citizens came to me and said, look, Boston and California both have laws that force women, force, excuse me, force doctors to tell women their options when it comes to breast cancer. They can have a lumpectomy, a lumpectomy for radiation, mastectomy, you know, more brutality and so on. Uh, doctors had to force, doctors were forced by these laws to tell their patients about breast cancer and the truth. Now, uh, they came to me and they asked if I would get the third law passed in the country, which is Hawaii, and so I did. 
And if you want to read the story of the difficulties I had with the Hawaii Cancer Society and the medical school in Honolulu and, oh, boy, all the other doctors, it reads like a novel. It's in the first chapter of my book, uh, uh, McDougal's Medicine. No, it's the McDougal Program for Women. It's called the McDougal Program for Women. You can find it. You can find it. It's still it's still uh, available on Amazon. It's out of print, though. And uh, in there, I talk about about what I went through to get the third law passed. Now there are over 18 laws in the United States that force men, excuse me, force doctors, or mostly men, that force doctors to uh, to tell women about. But they don't. They don't, they don't follow it. Not not to the degree that they ought to, for sure. Anyway, as, like I say, you you can look up the Canada 2019 recommendations for colonoscopy see the gated Canadian government gave up on it. Uh, you, you, you have the internet. You have a, a device. You can look all this up. You don't have to be blind anymore. No, not, not anymore. We do have this powerful tool. Yeah. Um, one more question, Dr. Maduro. What, what kind of stool test? Is this something that is done well, at the doctor's office? I mean, I mean how? But, you, know, you, buy, you buy these. Uh, uh, you, you used to be able to buy them in the drugstore. I think you can. Well, I know you can. You can buy them over the counter. Doctor can prescribe it for you. They're, they're tests for fecal blood. And then there's an immunologic test for blood. And then there's a, uh, a genetic test. It's called Cologuard. You see it advertised all the time on the TV now. It's about $600. It's a gen genetic, genetic test that looks for uh, genetic material that's produced by polyps or cancer. Cologuard, it's called. It's, it's very expensive. It doesn't give any better results than you get from a forty-dollar stool blood test. <clears throat> so uh, that's that's how you, you you check the stool, either by immunologic means wow. or blood or you know this new Cologuard technique. Oh, and you know that's 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 only one way. Like I said, the other way you can look for colon cancer is you can do a sigmoid. You could do a virtual colonoscopy, which is done with an X-ray machine. Or you could do a real colonoscopy with a six-foot tube stick up your butt. Okay, I think I prefer the virtual colonoscopy <laughs> if I had to do that. Well, you know, what, again, Gustavo, what I told you is I've recommended for well over 30 years, maybe 40. Right. That right. Uh, for screening, you ought to do one screening exam around age 60 with either a sigmoid or blood, or you know, check the stools. Doesn't have to be blood; it could be the other ones I talked about. Or you can do both, but anything more than that is too aggressive, too expensive, too risky. Right, right. All right, very good. Well, um, I don't know if you should we stop. Are you are you tired? <laughs> well, you know, you, you, you yeah, I want to talk about something else. Uh, okay, sure. I, I thought. You really, I, I know you re re requested I, I do a discussion on cancer, and I hope that fulfilled what you... Yes, yes, that's it. But, you know, you started out your conversation about talking about, uh, about the world. And I thought you were going to lead into what's going on in the world today, and which is something I want to talk to people about. I, you know, I, don't, I don't know what's going on in South America. I don't know what's going on in China. Russia or so on, except the same things going on that's going on in the United States. You know, we just had, uh, we have a situation going on on the West Coast, which is where I live, where pretty soon every single tree will be burnt. The wildfires are just totally out of control, no, no chance of controlling them. So we may be treeless pretty soon on the West Coast. Uh, you just uh, heard about the hurricanes hitting the Gulf Coast. And uh, the strongest hurricane that's ever hit this country. And uh, that hurricane finished off with flooding of the Northeast. Every place in the world, people are being touched by what's called climate change. Uh, no longer are there climate deniers. At least if there are, you ought to be laughing, laughing, laughing at them, if not being more aggressive towards them. Because what's been done has been to set up our planet in a almost unrecoverable state due to global warming, due to human activities. So uh, that's what I thought you were going to start talking about, because that's all that's on my mind these days, because, you know, the end of the world ain't a pretty thing to think about. 
Uh -huh. And what, what I'm dedicating my time to is a small segment of what needs to be done. Uh, you know, definitely we have to take care of the fossil fuels right away. The idea that we're going to have carbon capture, well, that's called trees. It's not going to be invented. It's called trees and plants and grasses and so on. So we have to be aggressive about that. We have to be aggressive about soil management. There are lots of ideas about how we need to fix the future. But there's one thing that nobody's really talking about uh, that I cho choose to talk about, and that's the implication of food. Uh, what we have is we have uh, clear statements that the agricultural business, primarily the animal food business, is destroying this planet. Uh, we know the planet's being destroyed thanks to Al Gore and his 2006 documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. But Al Gore didn't mention agriculture or beef. And there are some reasons why, and I could discuss them for you. Some reasons I understand. But uh, next came up uh, the Livestock's Law and Shadow, paid for by the Food Bank, put up by the World Health Organization, which is over a 400-page report that says that uh, our agribusinesses, particularly our livestock industry, accounts for 18% of the gases compared to transportation and all transportation, which is fewer than 14% of the greenhouse gases, cars, buses, trains, airplanes. Uh, that was uh, in 2006 also, but they didn't mention what to do about it. They didn't talk about, you know, really a dietary change. The World Watch Institute came out uh, a few years later and reanalyzed the World Health Organization data and included things that were really important. And they concluded that over 51% of the greenhouse gases are due to agribusiness. They didn't mention what to do about it. Uh, the Eat Lancet Commission came out in 2019. It probably the most authoritative uh, publication up to date on what's happening to our planet. And they tell us that we only have, I'm not even gonna mention how short a time. You can look it up. And uh, they clearly say that we can change things by changing our diet. They tell us that we can reduce greenhouse gases by 50 to 80% by going vegan. I mean, this is the scenario. You are sitting in your home with your family and you just went through a wildfire or a flood or a hurricane, or you just go out, you go, oh my God, it's never been so hot here. I don't care whether you're in the, the southernmost part of South America, the northernmost part of the continent of North America. It's hot. And you go, you know, I recycle. I drive a car that's very efficient in gas, but I feel like I'm doing nothing. What else can I do? Well, what else you can do is you can do what the Lead Lance Commission encouraged you to do, but didn't tell you what to do, and that is change your diet. They told you you could reduce your global warming gas output by 50 to 80%. Other studies show that too, that's all wild. But that's what you can do, and you can spread that as a mess worldwide but it's not being spread. As a final testament to how it's not being spread, I'd like to bring up Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates, of course, is a very wealthy, successful man. Microsoft, you understand where he got his money. He just, he's very concerned about the environment, spends lots of money making fake burgers and other types of things that are quite good for the planet. But he has a problem, and that problem is he can't see beyond his own dinner plate. And the reason I know this is he'll get into discussion, say, on 60 Minutes or CNN News. He'll be talking to the interviewer about how we should do anything, everything, consider any possibility to fix this planet. So he's really sincere about that. But unfortunately, he is conveying to the public a message that is still very harmful. He does his interviews in front of a, in front of a, in front of a beef burger or in his favorite local hamburger joint. He refuses to make a connection between his beef eating addiction and the climate. So here, you know, we've talked about some of the smartest men in the world, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates just in this discussion. And I want to tell you, they may be smart in computers, but when it comes to comes to medical issues and nutrition, they're still way off. Uh, anyway, I would love to get to Bill Gates and 
Because I think he's the man who, if he was confronted with, you know, this powerful tool that's been totally neglected, I just told you, that he would do something about it. I really think he, he's so desperate and knows the situation so well that he'd even eat a bowl of beans and rice like you and I are going to have today, Gustavo. So anyway, this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. I spent the first 45 yeah. years trying to get people to cure their diseases due to diet. Now, I took, now, I've, now I've got a new patient, Gustavo. I'm taking on a new patient. Correct. <laughs> it's the plan that hurt. And again, you know, I think about it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not asking for a, a big position. I just want to be noticed. You know, I just, I just want to have my hand up in the air and wave loud enough. And that's why I really appreciate being on your show, Gustavo. It's just a look, look, guys, you guys, you're going to do everything possible. You know, our, our ship is sinking. All hands on deck. You want all hands on deck? Well, you got to have this hand on deck. You know, I just would love because I know how people should eat to save the planet, just like I know how they should eat to save themselves. Yes, it's just, Dr. Maduro, I, I'm never going to give up, but I do get discouraged because I see that the addiction to these uh, uh, foods, if we could call them foods, uh, all the meat and dairy, the addiction is so strong and high that I believe some people would actually be sinking and dying but with the with the burger in their hands while they're eating it because they don't want to give it up and I and of course we have this multi-billion industry that um, I don't know how to fight against it. Well you know what you just said is something I'm going to carry on in my future discussions is that people would die with a burger in their mouth. It's just like, right. it's just like, it's just like as young doctors, we could never understand why people with lung cancer would smoke through their tracheostomy tubes. But they would. It's, you understand a tra yeah. hole, a hole in your throat? Right, right. They, they would sit in the ward dying of lung cancer, smoking through the tracheostomy. These, you're right, these addictions are overwhelming. But you know, the, the common person, just like I say, you're sitting in your house, all around you is devastation, and you all know it's hot. And you've got to think, if any, you know, eating, eating, eating a bean burrito ain't such a sacrifice. Eating a bowl of oatmeal shouldn't be a sacrifice. You know, there's something we can do. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, everything's going to change really radically, uh, Gustavo, as I'm sure Oh yeah, where people are, are, all people are aware. There's going to be massive changes worldwide. Yeah, and uh, you know, part of the solution, if there is one, is going to be to fix the food. Yeah, yeah. Which is but when, 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 uh, from the mouths of the experts and the people in power and the media and all that, we don't hear a word from it. Then, yeah, it becomes. Let, let, let me tell you uh, one of the things that I've been working with. As I was part of the foundation of a, of a medical society called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. In 2004, I had a bit of a part in getting them going. And I've uh, stayed peripherally involved with this organization, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I watched it grow from you know, 50 people to 5,000. And uh, they gave me an award, a Lifetime Achievement Award, in 2019. And I told him beforehand I didn't want the award. You know, I didn't want to travel to Florida to get it, et cetera. But I will if you'll give me nine minutes during my award presentation. And really reluctantly gave me nine minutes. And I gave a talk on climate change, which lasted 22 minutes. I got a couple standing ovations. Uh, I was invited back the next year, and I gave the same darn talk to thousands of people. And... In each talk, I said to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I said, you know, you're in the field of nutrition and you have wanted to treat people like I've treated them for the last 45 years with food so they could get well. And we all are in the same direction, you know, get rid of the animal foods, you know, go for the plant foods. And we're medical doctors and experts and scientists. I said to them back in 2019, as I said to them in October of 2020, as I just said to them yesterday, is the American College of uh, Lifestyle Medicine, the ACLM, needs to repurpose itself 
And these are experts who know about food. They don't know how to build Teslas. They don't know how to put up uh, solar panels, but they do know about food. And so far, Gustavo, I haven't been able to call them to action. My college, but if I could, I would have an instant army and I'm still working on them. Yesterday, I sent them a letter. I sent it to the president and the manager of the organization. I sent them a letter. I said, uh, you know, what, what do we need to repurpose? I said, the West Coast is burning up. Southeast is uh, suffering hurricanes and the Northeast is, is flooded. I mean, it's under five, 10 feet of water. I said, what do we need to repurpose? And then I asked him a question. How is history going to remember the 5,000 members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine? How are we going to be remembered? Well, right now, not proud, but the potential is there. And an organization like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has the potential to get behind this and to start a movement, a movement that could save people and, and part of the planet. And it just, oh, I'm not going to right. stop trying. No, well, we will need, we will, you know, I'm tireless as, uh, with, uh, with you. I, I, we will do a thousand webinars if we have to. And well, uh, so, you know, I, I appreciate, as I said, the opportunity to talk to your audience. And, yeah. and well, uh, if you, if any of you have any ideas about, you know, spreading the good word, then do it right now. Write, you know, sing about it. Yes. Act about it. Teach it in your schools. You know, it just, Whatever you can do, do, but it has to be around this particular cause because you don't know how to build Teslas either. Right. You know what I mean, but you do know how to eat. And, uh, and if we, we, we tell enough people, and our, our foundation, by the way, which is a legitimate foundation, has been around for about 15 years, collecting money to educate medical students and do research papers. We've done, uh, we've done, uh, we paid for two research papers in the third on our program showing its huge benefits as far as health goes. Anyway, we have a 501c3 foundation. Any of you who uh, have a little extra money sitting around, uh, this cause now is a cause to save the planet. We're no longer, we're educating medical students, but we do it by telemedicine now. And uh, research studies, I've done enough. I've proved what we do works. Don't need to spend that money anymore. But on their new project, we actually have a new website that I've spent the last three or four months developing and uh, you know, I, like, I, like I say, I'm gonna get my hand up there, I'm gonna start waving it and maybe somebody will notice. Well, we will keep waving our hands and uh, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. McDougal, everybody here is saying that this is a fantastic webinar and appreciate all the information and hopefully we'll get together soon. Anytime, Gustavo, it's always a pleasure. All right. You've been you've been not only a, a long time asset to me professionally, but you've been a long time friend too, and I really. Well, I am really. It's a it's a privilege for me to be doing these kind of webinars with you, and and I appreciate your friendship. So, thank right. you. Well, let's have a good day. Talk to you later. Okay. I'm going to go eat my uh, mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I just finished my oatmeal. <laughs> Bye. Bye.